Engineering Leadership Forum at Cisco and is the global exec sponsor for the Cisco's Women in, in Science and Engineering group. Please put your hands together for Liz and Tony. Afternoon. Thanks for that, Christian. So I know she talked about my bio. You can go online, take a look at it. I thought it, I'd spend a few minutes talking about, you know, personally who I am um, outside of work and what I bring into work. Um, that's my family. I have two kids. Actually, uh, that's an older picture um, of Nikhil, Alexa, and my husband, Mark. Actually, Nick is at the back over there, and you wouldn't recognize him from that picture. But I have the most recent pictures of our dog, Madeline. We have tons of pictures of Madeline, and I, I would say the picture of the family is about probably three years old. So you can see who takes priority in that. Some of the things uh, in terms of you know, kind of what um, best advice I've been given, I always get asked this question. And it's really about don't invent. So for example, you send an email out somewhere, and somebody doesn't respond within about 10 minutes or 20 minutes, and you're thinking, Ooh, did I upset them? Did I write it the wrong way? You know, you start overthinking and it just spirals. That is something I try to live by in terms of don't, don't invent and don't overthink. What's the, one of the quotes that's my most favorite quote? It's, uh, well-behaved women seldom make history. And uh, things I like to do, things that people don't know about me. I'm kind of goofy, and I know it doesn't show up in, in what I do in my day job, it's like people always say, hey, uh, you're intimidating at times. You know, you're impatient at times. But some of the things I do on a Saturday morning, 8 o'clock, my husband and I go to Target. Um, and if you, they actually play pretty good music. It's the time I actually get to practice my dance moves. <laughs> Nobody is around. The aisles are long. And they're very good in terms of practicing things like if you like Saturday Night Fever, that's the time I actually practice all my dance moves. Um, what's on my bucket list? I'd like to write a children's book. It's been on my bucket list for the last two years. I have the front cover done. That's about it. So but I, you know, I, was, I was talking to Janine about this, who's getting married, and she goes, can you get this done by the time I have kids? And I said, so how many copies are you going to buy? She said, one. <laughs> So I need a lot more than that, Janine. So what do I do at my day job at Cisco? Um, I run our Internet of Things business unit. IoT is not new to Cisco. We've been doing this for the last seven or plus years or so. But about a couple of months ago, we bought, brought this together into one business unit. And digitization, it actually touches every single business that we can think of. In media and entertainment, how you tell stories, how that content is delivered uh, directly to consumers. These are all the things that companies are thinking about in terms of how do we make more revenue? How do we improve the customer experience? How do we improve our internal processes to get more efficient as well? But what's a Internet of Things story if I didn't give you a few stats? I found this stat recently very interesting. So IDC said that by 2025, each one of us will have at least 4,800 interactions every single day with connected devices. That's one interaction every 18 seconds. I don't think I talk to a human that often every single day. What IDC also tells us is that when we go to an event, Two out of those three concert events, for, for example, will be connected where we'd have a connected virtual experience. And if you drive um, a connected car today, in the future, an autonomous vehicle will actually put out four terabits of data every single day. So what are we doing here in terms of helping our customers? It's three things that we build that are foundational to IoT. It's about security, it's about network, it's about helping customers with their data. So everybody hears lots of stats about devices, 20 billion devices by 2021. There's a ton of stats that are pulled out, put out by all the analysts. We read it, you guys read it as well. But what we also do is help customers figure out how to connect these various types of devices. 
It'd be, the world would be a whole lot simpler if the devices were connected with the same connectivity and communications protocols. But we have cellular devices, we have Wi-Fi devices, we have devices that are Ethernet. We have low power devices, for example, that need to be connected via things like LoRa, for example. We help our customers connect all of these. We help them manage it at scale. So for it, today, for example, we're helping the Port of Rotterdam, where we help them install 70 sensors in the, in the, in the port to help them measure things like salinity and water levels. You know why? Because they want to be able to guide ships coming in uh, to load more containers on the ship, because the more containers that you load on the ship, you increase the value in terms of what you actually unload and load as well. And we've done that to the tune of improving it by $5 million. We go from, from enabling customers with 70 sensors to hundreds and thousands of sensors as well. Each one of these sensors, think about it, 20 billion sensors by 2021 are emitting significant amount of data. As I talked about, an autonomous car will emit something like four terabits of data every single day. Today, a connected factory, think about it, an automaker, any factory that you can think of, a cookie maker, for example, could emit something like 1,000 terabits of data every single day. So how do we enable our customers to have control over that data? Because owning that data is a strategic choice that we want to be able to give our customers. What data do you need to compute at the edge because you want to make those decisions here and now? And what data do you want to be able to send up to those applications, regardless of where those applications are sitting, whether they're sitting in a private data center or they're sitting on-prem or sitting in a public uh, data center for that matter, in a public cloud at AWS Azure, for example. We enable our customers by building that platform to be able to do that. Now, one of the biggest things that our customers talk about with connected devices, the biggest issue is security. It's not just cybersecurity, but physical security as well. You have to be able to secure the devices. You have to be able to secure the data. You have to be able to secure your network. It's one of the biggest areas of obstacles that's stopping IoT initiatives or slowing those initiatives from actually proceeding faster as well. So today, in terms of security, we, Cisco is number one in security. We have a, the largest security portfolio. We build best of breed products in the category that we're in. It's, it's delivered as part of an integrated architecture. We help customers get visibility into those devices because if you can't see what the device is about it, you can't secure anything. We help customers do things like network segmentation because when a threat hits, you want to be able to actually isolate those threats so it doesn't spread throughout the entire, their entire network. Case in point, last year, actually June of 2017, there was a cookie maker in the US that got hit by a, a variant of uh, WannaCry. It's, a, it's the ransomware that hit just the month before that. And not only did this attack, which is uh, not Petya, because there was a Petya attack as well, but this was called not Petya, not only did it impact unpatched devices, it actually spread throughout the entire corporate network and impacted the patched devices as well. Things like network segmentation would have helped significantly not to stop the attack, but to be able to isolate it so it didn't spread. Things like threat monitoring. Because when you think about it, you know, in an operational environment, things are pretty consistent in terms of process. So how do you have capabilities like threat monitoring that allows you to see the anomalies? So these are the things that we're building, and Cisco is the only company that provides that end-to-end -end capability from everything from networking, security, and data management. So that's my first vignette in terms of very quick summary on what, what we do at Cisco and IoT, with IoT. That's really the 100,000-foot level. The other thing that Circle asked me to talk about is I've been at Cisco for 18 years. What's the, what's the career journey been like? And um, actually, before I go to that, let me actually touch on a couple of things in, in a couple of examples around what we do with, uh, with uh, IoT. How many of you have been to Las Vegas, ever? Wow, somebody loves Las Vegas here. <laughs> OK. Uh, you should join Cisco. We do our GSX every year uh, there, as well as Cisco Live at times. So it's no surprise that we have, they have 40 million uh, visitors that come into Las Vegas. What's the top of mind thing when I think about Las Vegas? I think about, geez, if you have to get from one end of the strip to the other end of the strip, it's really hard. It takes you 20, 25 minutes. I don't want to walk because it's, it's humid, it's dry humidity, and it's super hot, so I'm not walking. So you, you sit in whatever transportation that you have. The city of Las Vegas worked with us 
to put together a solution to improve things like congestion as part of their connected city. Improve congestion, um, improve things like pedestrian safety. I mean, think about it in the morning, 1 a.m. in the morning. Uh, a few inebriated people around, kind of staggering around, you know, whether it's on the pavement or in the streets. So this is something we're doing with the city of Las Vegas in terms of improving kind of overall uh, visitor safety as well. The other thing that we're doing is if you've gone to Staples Center, this is part of Cisco's IoT solution that helps improve kind of the fan experience. So I know when I go to a Giants game, um, when I'm, I'm watching one game, I'm actually streaming another game on my, on my mobile device as well. And sometimes, most often than not, it's, it's part of the, the FOMO thing. I don't want to miss out because I can't just live in the moment and experience you know, what's here and now. I have to make sure I'm not missing out on anything because, you know, geez, it's, it's, it could be a, a life and death event if I, if I miss out on what's the score in another game that's going on. Because you're usually rooting for one team or the other. And, and, uh, and so those are the things that I see a number of people do. How often do you go to a concession stand and you go, the line's too long, let me walk away? These are the experiences we're improving to give you the ability to see which concession stand and how uh, is shorter than the others. So we've helped Staples Center actually improve their revenue, both in the concession stand as well as some of the merchandise that we're selling. Some of the other things that we've done is in terms of improving road safety. This is an example of where we do things like collect, we have sensors at the roadways, and we're uh, working this with the Department of Transportation, uh, sensors at the roadways that actually collect data and compute that data immediately and provide signage in terms of what the road conditions are and actually provide that, that capability on uh, things like upcoming collisions uh, that you could, uh, could probably come up on in, in car as well. So moving on to talking about, you know, kind of my experiences over the last 18 years being at Cisco, I could, I could put it down into one theme. It's about fearless. And when I think about fearless, it's a, this is a picture that comes to mind. And I love that picture because I would love to be that, like that young girl standing in front of what looks like a raging bull on, uh, on Wall Street. I'm often reminded of this quote. I love the fact in terms of how Nelson Mandela and other leaders have used this quote that says, courage is not the absence of fear, but having the will to overcome it. To me, fearlessness is not something I was born with. I don't think anybody is born with that fearlessness. It's something that you have to learn and build every single day. It's a muscle that you have to build. And believe me, you can train yourself to do that, because I know I've trained that muscle better more than this muscle, um, even after working out um, over you know, the last 20, 25 years as well. But all kidding aside, um, every single day we're plagued by many fears, and some of it actually stops us in our tracks, or use it, you can use fear to actually propel you forward. So I picked three of my major fears that I've encountered throughout my entire career. And I'm sure those are pretty common, and I thought I'd love to share that with you. The first one is the fear of flaws. So I'm sitting there, totally enjoying what Heather's talking about, and then I'm thinking, oh shit, I am not funny. How do I go up there and say something that's interesting or compelling right after somebody who's gotten the entire house like cracking up? There's an example of, rather than, you know, kind of where that fear could almost paralyze me to where I was going to go over to Circle and say, do you just want Heather to continue? She seems to, you know, be the well, audience just seems to be enjoying. Do you really want me to go up there and talk about it? You know, all kidding aside, I've done that in meetings too. I'll go into a meeting, especially when it's a new domain for me, and I'll start the conversation this way. Um, I'm sorry that you have me presenting this because there's so many other people with a lot more domain knowledge who could be in here. And what you do is, and you look around the room, and if you actually observe is, people have, are looking at you like, uh, what? Because you put the spotlight on yourself in a, in a negative way to start off with, that you defocus people from what the topic of the conversation needs to be to focusing on the fact that did she say we're wasting our time being here because she doesn't know what she's talking about and she doesn't know, you know, so what exactly are we doing here? 
I've done this in terms of where I, I, I know I'm an introvert, so I have a hard time when we go to our global sales meetings, which happen in August. And one of the things I dread the most is walking into a room during the cocktail hour, because I'm going, oh shit, I've got to, I gotta go figure out who are the two or three people that I know, and then I'm gonna glom onto them. And uh, it's, it's, it's like one of those, uh, what do you, you know, like a serial stalker more than anything else, and wherever they move, I'm gonna move with them. <laughs> Because I don't want to have to talk to anybody else and make up because they'll know I'm kind of an awkward person and you know I'll, but what you what we don't notice when we do that is that we think about ourselves more than anybody else is thinking about us at the same time as we're thinking everybody is assuming that there's so many flaws and failures and faults about us everybody's thinking about their own failures and faults Growing up, I loved comic books. I still read comics. I used to collect comic books. And here's the reason why comic characters, um, and both DC and Marvel, I, I don't discriminate, um, <laughs> resonated with me is because each one of them had some sort of a flaw, except for Wonder Woman. She was like, perfect. <laughs> um, but each one of them actually had some flaw that they were trying to overcome, and they had the courage to overcome that and do really good things. I mean, think about it. Batman had to overcome his grief and anger when his parents were killed. Iron Man had to overcome the fact that he was greedy. And then you have Thor, pretty good looking Thor. <laughs> Thor had to overcome his arrogance. So everyone has something that they need to, to overcome. It's having that courage and training yourself in terms of, and every time when I think about this, if, if I, I, this is something that I took a picture of. I love this in terms of what George Martin said. Once you've accepted your flaws, no one can use it against you. My fear of uh, number two is a fear of change. 18 years of Cisco. This is my seventh job. I'm 10 weeks into my job. So when my boss first came and talked to me about taking on the IOT charter. My first reaction was, hey, this is great. You get to go in, new area, new domain, new things to learn. You get to put in new, your footprint on a new organization. And then once that euphoria died down, it's the same thing that happens to me again. The fear starts to set in and I'm going, yeah, but I don't know anything. I can spell internet of things. There's a lot of things I don't know about it. Um, I'm actually doing pretty well on where I am. I'm comfortable. After two years of, of being in data center, which was a different role when I took that on, I'm actually comfortable with what I do. And so I, I talked to my boss and said, you know, I need another year. And he goes, no, nah, actually, you know, I said, you know, I'm just starting to get comfortable where I feel, feel like I have both my feet like firmly planted on the ground. And he goes, that's the best time to move. <laughs> and, but the fear sets in in terms of thinking, you know, do I know enough about it? Can I set the strategy? Can I set a vision that would inspire people? And if I let that fear hold me back, I wouldn't be able to help set the direction for the organization, to rally the team, to be able to build a multi-billion dollar organization. And I can give you an example, multiple examples in terms of where, you know, you, you can either stay in the dry and the arid part, or you can pull along with you what would be green and sunny. But when you think about it is, no matter whether it's a new project or a new role, think about yourself from the perspective of being a student every single day. It will allow you, in terms of whether it's new experiences, a new role or a new project, it allows you to build new experiences, new capabilities. My number one fear is a fear of failure. Now, I haven't met anyone who said, yay, I love to fail. I have never met anyone who've said that. Every one of us fears failure. And as managers especially, you know, we, we stall at making decisions because we'd rather not make a decision than make a decision that would fail. And we hold ourselves, whether we're managers or individual contributors, from actually taking that opportunity. You can't sit there and look at what's plan A, plan B, and plan C, and let me pick the, actually the plan that has the least that has the most probability of success. Because then you don't have experiences like that sort of what Sir James Dyson has. 
So this is the bagless vacuum cleaner. Um, anytime I actually, this is out of my house, the, the, you know, the Dyson vacuum cleaner, I feel like I want to pick that thing and vacuum something, even when the house is really clean, because it's just so cool to look at. But if you look at what Sir James Dyson did, 2,627 prototypes later, he pretty much had no money. And his wife started working. 3,727 prototype. His wife actually took a second job because they really were running out of money. At the 5,127th prototype is when he was successful in building the world's first bagless vacuum cleaner. Now, I know that's an extreme example, but some of the best leaders that I know see failure as a complement to success. And as our ex-CEO and chairman said, we're defined by our failures and the lessons we choose to learn from it. Now, I know I've talked about you know, kind of the vignettes in terms of what are the, the three things that I fear the most. And believe me, this is something I work towards every single day. It's not something that you learn once and you say, I got this. It's like a muscle that you've got to train. But what's the one other thing that has helped me significantly during my career? It's advisors. Now, you can think of these as your connectors. You can think of those, these folks as your mentors and sponsors. It's the folks who actually nudge you towards new opportunities. It's the folks who give you advice on how to navigate the organization. It's the folks who actually tell you to take your parachute off and try things. I know that I wouldn't be in the role that I am today or have the opportunities that I have today without the advisors, without my mentors, without my sponsors. And I know one of them is sitting in the room, Dave Ward. I know that, you know, I used to sit, there's a, there's a kind of a positive and a negative in sitting next to Dave. He's crazy. But on the other hand, uh, there are times when there are things I couldn't understand. But I trusted Dave enough to where I knew he wouldn't judge me for not knowing some the, you know, kind of things in detail that I'd go sit down in his office later on in the evening. Um, and talk to him about it, and he would whiteboard and explain things to me. I mean, think about it. Even superheroes have their advisors. Batman had Alfred. You know, Jean Grey had Professor X. So even with all the cool tech that they have, they still needed advisors. This is one of the reasons why it's, it's my privilege to sponsor, be the sponsor for something like Women in Science and, and Engineering, because I know that I wouldn't have gotten here without being sponsored by somebody else. I am in a position where I can do that for others. And with what we do with Women in Science and Engineering, we reach a broader community of thousands of women. There's a superhero in all of us, every single one of us. We just need to find it and unleash it. It's like saying, unleash the Kraken. It's like, unleash your inner superhero. And I'll leave you with this. Be brave, be bold, and be fearless. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the time. Thank you for that glimpse into IoT, Liz, and how Cisco is improving um, you know, the customer experiences in IoT as well as your shared experiences. Hopefully, she has inspired all of you guys um, to have the courage to overcome your fears. Up next, I have the privilege of introducing Cheryl Bayer. She is the CEO of Living Pop-Ups and is an entertainment industry leader in casting and development talent, marketing, and branding campaigns. She started with her own casting company and then moved on to the talent and development at ABC Productions, packaging agent at CAA, and is the senior, and the senior VP of comedy at Fox. She was a key player in bringing us In Living Color, Baywatch, Dream On, Roseanne, My So-Called Life, Home Improvement, Malcolm in the Middle, That 70s Show, and Family Guy. Please put your hands together for Cheryl. Hi, I, I, I hope I have like a combo of the both uh, from Heather and from Liz, because I feel like I organically thread um, both things. One is 
I am Cheryl, <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> um, and right now we're doing um, living pop-ups, which I'm very excited about because having been somebody who's come from a background that um, has entertainment um, and I see the fabulous technology out there, we have found a way to really um, utilize both strengths in our company. And so, oh, I'm going backwards. Oh. Okay, so my grandfather was my first inspiration. A five foot three, that's me at my bat mitzvah picture, by the way. Um, <laughs> fearless, creative, think outside the box guy, resourceful, escaped Hitler um, and came to this country with nothing after have, having built a billion dollar industry in lumber in Europe and internationally and saved most of my family and said, gonna do it here, gonna do it here, gonna start and always teach me to be open-minded, to be kind, to be curious and to be a good listener. Being wired differently, okay. I'm wired differently. I have two boys who are now men, 22 and 24, who are all wired differently. And I'm fascinated with human behavior. And um, I, was, I was purely validated by my thinking differently and being wired differently when I had my SATs. Does everybody remember those questions? When a train is coming from Kentucky and another one is coming from Ohio, one is with oranges, one is with apples, they meet on a Tuesday and when is the moon full? I wrote on my SATs, what do you want from me? <laughs> okay. I was very blessed because um, I was aware that I was wired differently. I saw people, I grew up in New York City, and I saw people, whether we were the richest person or the poorest person, we were on the same subway car. And my armpit was no greater than anybody else's. <laughs> And so I saw that we are one at a very young age. Well, this woman who read my SAT actually said, called my parents and was a blessing and said, you know, your daughter might not know this word math problem. She'll figure it out, but she's got a great sense of humor. And so I really appreciate that because my parents from that moment forward supported who I was and what I was about. Not that they didn't beforehand, but it was a validation like, hmm, she'll get it. So what I noticed, I noticed that I was gonna trust my gut and my heart at all times, and that everyone wants to be seen and heard. And I kept asking, what can I do and how can I help? Because if I kept myself listening like my grandfather said, I can see where somebody, where there was a problem or somebody had a problem and I could listen to that and I can figure out or throw out ideas, suggestions, how to come up with solutions. So I started working in a casting office when I was 16 and I heard all these actors tell me about different methods they were taking and I'm like, that's like a new language. Well, my grandfather speaks seven languages and I don't know, I barely know German. I kind of know a little French from high school. Then I took a little Spanish in college. So like I have these abridged, uh-huh, uh-huh. See, si, we, oui, thank you, yes, okay. And um, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna first learn how to invest in my career by learning these different methods. I never wanted to be an actress. By the way, this is kind of terrifying. But, um, so I never wanted to be an actress, but I always knew I wanted to be an advocate. So I started taking different kinds of methods and I was communicating to different actors. And the next thing I knew, the first uh, casting session where my boss said, get dressed nice, you're gonna be running the session tomorrow. I was 16 years old, was Courtney Cox in um, Bruce Springsteen's music video. And I was like, they kept looking at me, which one do you think should, we should go? And I go, it's her. <laughs> uh, I knew talent. I could see when somebody was talented. So my mentors, okay? First one, it's not in any order, but they're all kind of really badass, cool people. Um, my uncle is Henry Winkler, okay? 
who also has dyslexia, who has written children's books about being dyslexic, who I remember my grandparents did not approve of being an actor. Um, and um, so uh, he was like a big brother to me. And he said, Cheryl, two words, yes and. Yes and will gather more information. So yes and has been my mantra since I was three. Gary Marshall was a man who would listen to anybody's ideas because he knew that if he was open and was a good listener, that the truth was an idea can come from anywhere. And he said, yes, and. Then I worked for a woman named Marcy Carsey, who was phenomenal. And um, she's one of the producers of Roseanne. She did um, Bill Cosby's show. She, she's always been somebody who just celebrated whatever idea I had and said, go do it. So um, I appreciate that. Peter Chernin, Grant Tinker was another person who was phenomenal, and so was Brandon Tartikoff. Um, and I will say that Peter Chernin is the person who said to me, who would call me and go, what do you think of this title? I'm like, huh? He's like, I, I want your ideas on this title. And I was like, OK. And just because I was trusting my gut and I was always being honest and truthful, I was, I was fearless. I didn't realize that there needed to be fear. I was five feet tall. My grandfather was 5'3", and he walked into any room like he owned the place. And I thought, oh, OK, well, unless they tell me not to come, I'm here. <laughs> um, so having mentors with different perspectives. And then I do want to highlight this woman, Anne Marie Harbor, who's at Magic Leap, who's a young girl who's phenomenal, who's like, Cheryl, Use what you know. As you are in technology, and you've been in education, and you've been in entertainment, use what you know and you know, do it. And so we started doing it. We started doing it. So when I go into rooms, I do want to say, because like, I've been in rooms with Rupert Murdoch. I've been in rooms with you know, it, like the biggest names in corporations to technology. and. I believe, as I said before, say what you mean, mean what you say, and don't say it mean. People just want to be heard. So how can you say what you mean and not say it mean? It's easy if you think about it, the power of positive words. OK, my degree is human behavior as it relates to programming. So psychology, sociology, television, and film. I love telling stories. That's why the list of TV series that they were talking about. I ask certain questions on every single project or every company. What is it? How does it work? Who are they? Who are we? When we're developing stories of compelling characters that are people that you relate to and invite into your home each week, they better be people that you want. You have, I have the privilege of doing that to be invited into your home. That's successful programming. And why now? Why are we meeting them now? What's important at this moment? What are messages that people are bringing up that they feel they need to hear? So when I was, so character, Storytelling, it's about human beings. That's how we started as cavemen talking around, you know, come, talking in the cave as storytellers. That's how we were as tribes and around the campfire. It's like you've got to look at how do we tell our stories? What is, and, and then from a story as you relate to it, and as I was looking at Liz's diagram of she's into education, she's into entertainment, and she's into tourism, right? Those are all huge industries. Well, we, met, we better make humanized, relatable characters that can continue in this path, that use the technology so we can monetize it. These are all the shows and stuff I've been a part of, blah, blah, blah. OK, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I only have a few more minutes. Um, <laughs> um, well, I, I, and the reason why I'm saying that is because, yes, they are important. Did anybody really want to see all that stuff? Um, here. Um, that's, uh, I do want to say, that 70s show was something about the truth about teenagers um, and what they're doing in their parents' basement, OK? Though, that was a topic. It's like, bring in humor. Humor makes you laugh a little bit open for hard topics. It, it sparks conversation. So that 70s show, underage sex, smoking pot, stealing your parents' car, 
having a keg party. How many of you have done those things? Anybody? Anybody willing to admit it? <laughs> Thank you. Yo, back row. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was like, how do you bring a sense of humor to something and then a conversation? I had to deal with the government who wasn't accepting of what we were doing. And I had to say, no, we can actually bring a parent and a child into the same room watching this, laughing at it, using the context of the 70s because of the age difference, and start a conversation that's healthy. They let me put the show on the air. Malcolm in the Middle, I was fascinated with birth order. Fascinated. I come from a family of three girls. I'm the oldest. But I always watched my middle sister, who always thought everything anybody was talking What are you talking about me? Yeah. So um, when, I, when I was at CAA, you know, bringing Sarah Silverman out, she walked, ran around the room. And this was a big corporate fancy building with, that was designed by a fancy architect and you know, had fancy artwork. And I'm like, look, guys, she's going to pop around this room and scream vagina. But it's about the voice of a new generation. You know? and, and freaks and geeks, I always saw there was this time. And I have a 15-year-old boy trapped inside my body. OK? Uh, she had a gay man. Um, Heather had a gay man. I have a 15-year-old boy. But I was like, we're all awkward in middle school and high school. And we all can't wait to get out of those times, even though they're like such compelling and interesting times. But we don't feel seen and heard. And we don't know who we are just yet. And Freaks and Geeks, to me, was a way to show people we can have a sense of humor about who we are. The same way Sex in the City, I saw I had a lot of single friends who I wanted them to know, they're baller. And there was a book that had been passed on that was written by this woman, and no one wanted to touch it. And until I gave it to Sarah Jessica Parker, who I said, because I do also love comics, and I love um, Spider-Man. I quote him all the time. Um, I say, with great power comes great responsibility. That's what Spidey says, OK? <laughs> and I'm like, how do you get power? You have to gather information, OK? And once you gather information, then you can tell me whether you like something or not. Well, Sarah, Sarah Jessica Parker was not interested in doing television. So here I am. I'm quoting Spider-Man to her. And I'm going, you know what? You tell me, once you have the information that you've read this script, then I'll listen to you and respect your opinion if you believe this. Now, I don't know where I got that from. Like, I've just. Oh, it, I think it's the 5'3 guy from Germany who like survived, really. With great power came great responsibility. Be fearless. Be curious. OK, I'm back here. Now I'm switching using how I've taken the success of traditional media into where we are today. Now, I'm realizing that this is missing a chunk of my life because I left Fox. And I opened up a place called Creative Space because I saw all these kids were being wired differently, were being uh, labeled, and were wired differently. And I was like, why? All these labels felt to me like they were removing kids instead of communalizing kids. So I opened up this place in Los Angeles where we had an early intervention. I had never been in education, but I saw a problem, and I was looking to have a solution. So I was like, hmm, OK. I'm going to make a cool ass look in place so that no one feels like it's for autistic or anything else. I'm going to create a place called Creative Space. And I did it from my heart and my gut. And with that, I brought in, um, it looked like a New York City loft space. It had a queen size bed in the, in the lobby. It was the it place to be. I had people from show business calling. It was an early intervention preschool. We did um, enrichment programs around uh, all of Southern California. I'd been asked to franchise. I was, at that point, becoming a single mother. Um, I have a really good relationship with my ex-husband, though, so I wanted to say it can be. Um, and, uh, and, I, uh, saw, and I had a sleepaway, a day camp that was international, and a sleepaway camp 
that was like, a, so the day camp was like Burning Man and the sleepaway camp was like Amazing Race. So always looking at like tonally being kind of cool. I saw kids at, at an early age were like interested in skateboarding and before the guys became jackass, I called those guys and I'm like, Tony Alva, Tony Hawk, I'm like, hey, Let's teach them how to build and design their own skateboards. Hey, Stomp was like, you know, just becoming popular. And I called my friends who were the original cast members and I go, hey, it's actually good for like visual perceptual stuff, hip hop and body percussion. Let's get the original cast members of Stomp to teach here. And so, um, and before it was School of Rock, we were doing writing and recording your own music. And I didn't mean for a kid's place to go into in style or entrepreneur or the Sunday New York Times magazine section, but it struck a chord. It was programming that struck a chord. And when I saw that I could do it, and I, my biggest highs, I made a lot of bonus money. I made a lot of money in show business, but my biggest highs are like having a kid who graduates from high school, is going to Carnegie Mellon, and is on a trip to like Europe and stops at some place where he's like remembering, you taught me about awareness. You taught me about being kind and generous. You taught me about being curious and being respectful in ways that most people think it's please and thank you. And I was like, oh my God, that is awesome. You know, those are, those are the fan mails that I love to get, okay? Um, so with that and seeing how we can do it in the, in the brick and mortar, okay? And I, like I said, I've been asked to franchise around the world. I saw we can do using technology, using entertainment and storytelling, using you know me as a key to develop characters, whether it be in 3D animation or we're just finding the sweet spot in photorealistic, using it in education. Oh, this is the demo reel. Should I show you a little something? I'll show you a little something. Cue the video. <laughs> Hey guys, what's up? This is Kai coming to you live from your phone. The word dictator. Oh, it has a lovely ring to it. Welcome to the Colosseum, Rome's most iconic landmark. You think I'm the only one to take advantage of a little fear? That's my beautiful Mona Lisa. Bravissima! Do you know what treasure means? Um... Do you? That's right! Our focus. Oh, <laughs> so, again, I go for compelling stories. So, to me, there's required reading from first grade through twelfth grade, and then there's textbooks in college, and. I, love, I loved reading, even though math was not my forte <laughs> at the time. Now, it's, now I've, I've built up my booby arm. But, um, but uh, required reading is still exists. There's four million students just in the United States alone who have to read f at least four to six books a year, be it a boxcar children or be it Animal Farm or To Kill a Mockingbird. And tonally, it's about reaching your audience and engaging them in a way that I would prefer for them not to have a spark note or for you to pay a tutor that's a couple hundred dollars, but to actually empower a student to actually read the material and engage with the book and have the characters pop up. If it's To Kill a Mockingbird, I'm not gonna speak like a, to a little kid. 
I'm going to have the first verse of a something that look. It's Gwen Stefani's "I'm Just a Girl," and then my version of Scout is going to go. I'm just a girl, just like her. Why are they giving me such a hard time wearing pants? And she's not only going to ask you that. I have one of my best friends is black. Why are we talking about this? And talk about why it was then. And so whether it's a multiple choice question or a thematic problem, we're talking to students in a different way. Now, I had, we were at this conference, AWE, which is Augment World Expo, and we were asked to, um, uh, and the, the University of Michigan, the head of University of Michigan's pediatrics came up to us and said, I've been doing research for six years trying to find the technology partner that I feel I can relate to. And I said, OK, well, um, respectfully, you know, what's, what are you looking for? And he said, OK, I, I want to like, try two use cases. I said, awesome. One in the textbook, because people read textbooks, and they go, uh-huh. But then from that, how do they really see surgery? Or so can we do like pop-ups that you know show examples and be precise? I said, absolutely. I said, he said, so I want to do like a student, and I go, wait, we're all wired differently. Can we at least do three different kinds of people so that your students can choose which one they think they're more like? Because that way you'll actually get what you want from the material, right? I said, so he's like, I knew I found my people. I said, oh, your name is Prashant. You are, you wrote the textbook that everybody in the United States uses for pediatric medicine. I said, West needs East. It is the whole world. It's only half the puzzle. So in the same way, the technology is half the puzzle. The other half of the puzzle is storytelling. And you need both. He said, let's do it. Great. He said, the second use case scenario is in, um, in the uh, ER. When a seven-year-old boy comes into the uh, ER and he's complaining of a stomach ache, I said, OK. He said, and he doesn't know he's going to meet all these strangers. They're going to poke and prod him and take you know, blood. And he doesn't know he's going to have surgery. He has appendicitis. I go, well, is there one type of kid? I go, can we, can we maybe pick two different kinds of boys and one girl? Girls are more versatile. They can either, it, more girls can see boy in themselves than bo girls can. So he said, OK. And I said, plus, there's three different parent styles. So let's take three different kids, three different parent styles. And now, from the, you thought this was going to be a distraction just for a child. Not only is the child engaging and picking which one they are, but now your staff is also learning from this, this experience and seeing it's not just a patient. It's a human being. And there are different kinds of human beings. And you're going to have a different approach in that emergency room situation from seeing the, different, the three different perspectives. He was like, done. I said, do you have to write a grant? He goes, no, I have my own money. I go, excellent. <laughs> so we are storytellers. We look at the, and I brought up that example just to illustrate how we work, OK? How we are mindful of using the technology, making it useful uh, and applicable, and then emotionally connect all the Rashomon effect. That, that scenario I gave will connect the child, will connect the parents, and will connect the students and the doctors themselves. OK. Here we are. Um, part of our team wrote the book Straight A Conspiracy, which is that most people do tell themselves an inner narrative before when they say, I can't or I don't have, you know, the, I don't have the math gene. No, I actually have the math gene. I just had to work it harder. OK? We did Charlie Fink's book. Charlie Fink is the ARVR contributing editor of Forbes magazine. He asked us, can we make, so this, this is a theme about scalable. This is a, a theme about like efficiency. 
and making a product that actually is sold in the marketplace. So he asked us, the day after Thanksgiving, I get a call from Charlie Fink who says, I'm doing this book about, um, I'm doing this book. I'm the ARVR contributing editor of Forbes and I was told you're the people to come to. I'm thinking I just wanna pop up on the top of the book. And I go, okay. Um, well, what's the book about? Because that's just a gimmick and I'm not interested in doing Happy Meal toys, okay? They're disposable. I'm looking at creating a product that's like sustainable. He said, well, the book, I'm not finished writing it. It's due, uh, it's going to print on January 3rd and we're premiering it at CES at June 9th, uh, January 9th. And I go, okay, so we have eight weeks. So what's the book about? He said, well, ultimately it's about how technology is evolving and so is human behavior. I said, awesome. Let's create a Seinfeldian group of characters who like live together. We'll see how their use of technology evolves and so does human behavior. That book sold out on Amazon, has been sold out on Barnes and Noble and we got another order of a thousand. It's just become Kenyan College computer science required reading. And, and all of the reviews in, in Amazon are not that they've read this book page by page, but it's the AR enabled part of the book. So for us in education, how we monetize this is if a child, First of all, teachers love this. School systems are loving this. So we're very excited that we've come with a product that actually has viability using the technology. We're also looking at the organic way that humans are using their technology and their devices this moment right now and how we can have them evolve. So all the assets that we're creating are available to do AR and interactive AR reading comprehension workbooks in your phones right this minute. Those same assets, as if we do go into glasses and lenses and like, okay, will be available. That's my Aborigine speak, by the way. But I feel like soon we're all just gonna be talking shorthand. Uh, <laughs> you knew what I meant, right? Um, anyway, we're looking at creating those same characters, whether it's in Boxcar or Animal Farm or anyone or Othello, those same characters, if you have a kid who has learning differences or you have a kid who's mainstream or you have a kid who's accelerated, will have the same characters in the same classroom and the teacher can pick which one they want the kids to read so that they know they're setting their child, those children up for success. It's an app. Yes, right now it's an app. Is it, it come, and you can buy the reading required app and you can have, you can try one book at $3.99 if you want a toe dip. If you want to buy five books to six books, because that's what you're, it's more like $12.99, so we've come up with a monetization plan. And if you're also wanting to buy your series, like, ah, I'm gonna do middle school and I'm gonna just do it like a subscription, then we can do that too. If a child is asking for a parent, can I try that? To help them, they're not gonna go, no thanks. They're gonna go, of course, you wanna help in reading? Excellent. If a parent finds something cool and they're the cool parent, a child's gonna go, oh, that's cool, I'll try that. It happens, I've been there. So that's in education. In tourism, the same assets, most of them, that are in um, your art history book or like you saw um, Leonardo da Vinci coming down, I can create a whole narrative of a city that uses all kinds of storytelling that has the characters pop up. Way more interesting, way more integrative than listening to a boring audio tour or I've watched those guys with the flag walk by <laughs> and half of you can't hear them, right? It's something that has a FOMO effect, as we did something for the Natural History Museum in New York. Oh, will you cue this? Because we d I said to Jamie, we were in New York, and I said we were at this thing called the Art of VR in uh, so at Sotheby's or something. And I said to him, oh, just try, just start doing it. People were having their phones up, like, as if, and they were videotaping it and sharing it with friends. Grandparents were coming up, my grandson wants that. Um, can we cue this? Yeah. 
It could be target-based, it could be geolocation, it could be anything, but you're creating a narrative. Our, our pterodactyl actually has part of the backstory. So kids were like interested, wait, what did he say? What's he about? I, I was just blown away, thank you. All good. Because uh, I'm realizing I'm, uh, I'm running out of time. Then we've been approached by brands and bands and um, for their live events, big ones. Uh, so we're like, hey, we can do this. We can create from your ticket to a couple of songs on your tour in your stadiums. And why not create additional merch on your merch of your t-shirts? We can have your characters pop out. So we've been working with a couple of really big bands right now. So I talked about the monetization. We're very excited about that um, because we see it's actually working. And we see that we can create narrative that people really relate to. And the next thing I want to do is really like a series that lives in your world and that you find different pieces around your world. So I'm very excited. Anyway, thank you very much. I'm Cheryl. <laughs> Thoughts on this mic? Oh, it's working. Hello. Keep it going for the two wonderful women that we just saw, please. <laughs> Cheryl Bayer, Liz Santoni. Oh, I'm going to get off the stage. I'm going to talk to you guys for just a minute and pretend that I can do stand up uh, while they set this up over here. Where is Liz right now, by the way? Is Liz still in? She stepped out. Um, it's so funny. Be or it's crazy. I was talking to Heather Pasternak, who's the stand-up... I'm going to get off the stage. <laughs> and she actually feels the exact same way as you, Liz, wherever you are. She said to me when I asked her to do this, she said, are you sure that they want me? I mean, they're all like professional, amazing business people. and I'm going to talk about cats. That was a joke. Thank you. I, I, thank you very much. No, I appreciate that. Uh, I think it's going really well. Um, I actually did do stand-up for a while. Would you like to see my impression of uh, the ending of every action movie of all time? Yeah? OK. Thank you. Hold on one second. I have to prepare. I'm method. So the end of every action movie of all time. Hey. Be careful. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. That's very nice of you. I actually have one more. Are we done? This is set up now. I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> this is the end of every romantic comedy ever. Would you like to see that? Yeah. Oh, thank you. OK. End of every romantic comedy of all time. Hey. Thanks. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Wow. I might get I might get back into it. Okay, I'm gonna hand the, the mic over to someone who knows what they're doing. Please. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, up next, uh, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing an exciting panel um, where we'll hear from four female technical leaders um, who are shaping the trends and technology and entertainment um, in their communities, as well as their shared experiences on their car career journeys in these respective fields. Um, please put your hands together and help me welcome Lisa for the moderator, Serple, Jerry, Kathy, and Lori, who will be on the panel. <clears throat> <laughs> Stand up. Okay, wait. There we go. All right, hello everyone. I just want to take a minute to kind of go down the line and introduce ourselves and say a little bit. We'll start with you, Lori. Fantastic. Um, this is me when I got my divorce. 
Yay! No, just kidding. <laughs> I thought I would. Is that good? Okay. Um, I'm Laurie Schwartz. I run a, a consultancy called StoryTech, and I've been working in strategy and consulting around technology for the last uh, 12 or 13 years. I started when I was 12. Um, and uh, so you can do the math there. And um, one of the big things I do is walk executives around big trade shows and explain to them what they're seeing and help them understand the trends around the technology and the story around the technology. And so it's very exciting to be here for the last couple of days where we're talking about tech and storytelling together, because that's really what I've, I've spent my career doing. One thing I just want to add to that really quickly as you talk about what you do is if you could include something, uh, what excites you about what it is that you do? What excites the little kid in you? Why do you love it? So just a little oh, well, bit I love that. I love it because every time I see a new gadget, I buy it. Yeah, <laughs> but, but mostly teaching. I love teaching, teaching people about the tech. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarpil, and I'm a distinguished engineer here at Cisco. I've been a network engineer for about many years. <laughs> Don't do the math. <laughs> and um, as a distinguished engineer, my job is to uh, create the next generation of the internet infrastructure, along with many of my colleagues who are here today. Um, I'm also the founder of the Women in Technology program at Cisco, and I'm working uh, with women in science and engineering leadership team to help women uh, accelerate their careers in tech. And um, I really like it when I work on a project and then I see that it's implemented out on the internet, like on a Comcast network or somewhere. Uh, it's very cool to think that you have contributed to the society in general. Um, hi guys, so I'm Jerry Martinez. I am currently the client exec for the Disney account here at the fabulous world of Cisco. So I spend my days um, in the technology world, which I absolutely love. Been here doing it at Cisco now for uh, just over eight years. Uh, so what excites me about my job, I have been in technology since as long as I can remember. Um, I got my first robot at the age of six and have always wanted to do computers. So it was no question that I'd end up at a technology company somewhere doing something. Um, I've been in the world of media for just short of a year now, and I'm loving everything about my job and everything that uh, I am doing today. Uh, media really is a place to be right now, so it's quite exciting. And you guys have all heard of Disney, right? Maybe. So, um, so it's great. And I'm Kathy Sharp Ross. My agency is the Sharp Alliance, and I started the company 30 years ago. So for women entrepreneurs, you know, it, it's quite inspirational to know that before. These conversations were happening, and we were being given permission to do all this that I founded the company. Uh, what's particularly fun is seeing the convergence of Hollywood, entertainment, technology. They used to be so separate. Now they really are so intertwined. Uh, the little kid in me is the lover of connecting people and people's stories. And that shows up in a lot of places in our, in our world with what we do with all of our clients and being able to utilize the technology that exists today to tell our clients and companies stories of the brands and companies that we work with. So it really brings all of my passions and interests and our skills as a company together. Great, perfect. Jerry, you said something about the um, Disney, about Disney, and there was an announcement that was made yesterday. Um, can, you, can we start there? Can you talk a little bit about that, about that excitement? exciting announcement that was made? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's uh, incredibly exciting. So for those that were here yesterday or happen to check out the rags, um, Cisco and Disney have a joint venture for an innovation lab um, really sponsored out of our CTO's office um, who has joined us today. And it, it's quite exciting. Our two companies are coming together to innovate in solutions, um, mostly focused today on pre and post production. Um, I think it's a, it's a great time for our two companies to really collaborate. I think that for some folks in the industry, they probably stepped back for a moment and said, wait a minute, Cisco, networking company, collaboration company, wait, Disney, media, what is going on? And I think it's allowing really a lot of buzz within the industry to say, wait a minute, we didn't see this coming. What are they doing together? And it's a really exciting time with our two companies. Congratulations. Thank you. Very, very exciting. Very exciting. Let's have a hand for that exciting person. Yeah. <laughs> So speaking of new developments, so Kathy, when we had our prep call, you said something about adopting and adapting throughout the years as technology changes. Um, talk about that a little bit and just what you've seen, where we were a year ago 
with tech in general, I know you work with a lot of different right. clients, uh, versus where you thought we would be. Absolutely. Um, God, I could go back to where we were 30 years ago. I was on a typewriter. <laughs> I used a telex machine with my uh, colleague in Hong Kong. You're going, what is that? Um, but I think what's really fascinating is the exponential growth and increase of what is happening in the marketplace. And we are working with a huge hologram company that is producing hologram concerts around the world. The technology that is present today is enabled things that we've never been able to see and do before and is creating new ways of actually bringing entertainment into the world, telling stories, and making it really a much more sort of accessible opportunity for all of us. Um, the way we're all connected is fascinating. I happen to be a big fan of all of the social media platforms because for me, it's a tool for our clients. It's a tool to communicate. So the more that technology advances, the more that we can really leverage it, as long as we know its place and where and how to use it, it's really become one of the most revolutionary parts of our business. I mean, as a marketer, as a brander, we're looking for ways to really break through a lot of the clutter. And if we're doing it right, we can really do it well, and we can use the right tools to do that with. So it's been really important to sort of watch the advances and get in front of them and figure out how to use them properly. Great. Yeah. Serpil, same question. We talked a little bit about 5G and connectivity and just the speed of things and the way connectivity is changing. Where were we a year ago and where is that? Serpil and Jerry, I'd like to speak to that. To our, our yeah, yeah that sure. <laughs> First of all, I also just want to take a minute. For those of us who don't know, can you tell us um, a little bit about Distinguished Engineer and what, I mean, there are some of us who don't know in here, I think. Show of hands, people who don't work here at Cisco. Okay, four. Great. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's pretty amazing. And I just wanted to give you the chance to talk about it a little bit because it's yeah. impressive stuff. Um, in the technical track in your career, um, you can progress as much as you can progress in a management track. And Distinguished Engineer is uh, one of the advanced uh, stages in uh, one's, an engineer's career. It's, I believe, uh, similar to senior director level. Um, uh, the, the, it's a big honor to be a Distinguished Engineer. It takes a uh, lot of work to get there, uh, requires lots of testimonials from outside and inside the, in the uh, company, and um, it's really putting together the entire career you had until that moment and presenting it. So I'm really happy to be one of the six, I believe, uh, distinguished engineers at Cisco. Mm -hmm. I think we have over 200 total, so we need more. <laughs> What was it? Uh, become your own superhero. So there you go. <laughs> yes. Um, so now to that question, um, advancements and... Yeah. So uh, in networking, in the last uh, five, seven years, we've been seeing, we've been hearing words like SDN, which is Software Defined Networking. But the whole idea is that you have the internet infrastructure that's been in place for many, many years. It works great, but it's kind of static and hard to... Uh, uh, upgrade, replace, do newer things with it. So in the Chief Technology and Architecture Office, we've been focusing on how to make the network more programmable, uh, using the data analytics and the intelligence to uh, come up with uh, new services uh, on the network. So 5G is one of the ways, uh, especially on the uh, edge of the network, to increase the capacity, increase the capabilities, um, so, you know, we talk a lot about the storytelling, the applications, and uh, all the new stuff coming, but all of that eventually streams through the infrastructure, internet infrastructure, and so uh, it's our job to make it uh, uh, much more sophisticated and much more intelligent, and there's definitely been a big movement. I think we have passed the SDN stage at this point. It's now all about automation, analytics, machine learning, and AI. So we're making progress. Thank you. I think I understood 90% of it, maybe. That's a, OK, that was overshooting. Um, Lori, same question. You talked about, we talked about the Internet of Things 
a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I actually thought that we'd be further along in how many people um, adopt consumer devices in their home so that they have a connected home. So a lot of my colleagues have gotten Alexas and are playing with that. And when you walk into my house now, pretty much everything is Alexa driven. And what, what we noticed in our house, and I have an eight-year-old, is that when for some reason the broadband goes out, we are completely helpless. And so all of a sudden there's no entertainment. My daughter can't call me from the Alexa from another room. We, we, we have no idea what's going on. <laughs> and even my garbage can now opens through a connection. So, uh, I've seen it. So it's just, um, then I just do what I've always done, and I pick up the phone and I order in. But, um, <laughs> but it's, changed the, it's changed the dynamic for us. And I, I thought that would move along a little faster, sort of outside of my sort of LA, New York world, it hasn't quite spread as fast, but I know it's happening. And Alexa sales and deployment are really high and getting higher. So I, so I think that's interesting and exciting. Is AI sort of surprising all of us? I feel like it is just. I think the applications we're seeing for AI. So the subject matter, the how does it work, what does it do? But I think we're seeing the way it's showing up in so many different parts of our worlds, both business-wise and personal is quite staggering and sometimes daunting, sometimes really exciting. But I think to me, when I look at AI and it, it just keeps popping up everywhere, yeah. I think there's just, it's so evident of how we are going to continue to grow with AI being such a rudimentary part of our world. I think it'll be a right. faster moving yeah. train too than perhaps some of the yeah. other technologies. I mean, we've exactly. been talking about cloud for yeah. ever now, right? It just feels like it's finally starting to get more adopted, and I think AI is going to be on a fast track. Yeah. There's also the cu cultural understanding of AI, which is mostly that robots are going to take over the world, right? And, th and that's what we all understand. Did you say robots or Ro robots? robots? <laughs> okay, just to be clear. <laughs> robots with robots on them okay. will come from the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> and, but dystopian science fiction movies have really sort of set up this fear of AI, I think. And AI has been around for years, really helping, um, from the world I come from marketing, helping marketers figure out who to put ads to. And AI has been around for a long time making other decisions. It's just now the contemporary normal person understanding of AI and the technology are sort of meeting and the definitions are different. And so I think that's what's going on right now is we, we have to come to a place where it's not so fearful for the consumer, you know? Or it's more about machine learning and neural networks than robots. Yeah, but, but I wouldn't even call it those words with, with regular people. That's the thing is right. you have to market tech in a way that everybody you know, can make it friendly. So like, like saying, you know, ask Alexa for the recipe. You know, not what's the database we're accessing. Right. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I'm saying? It's really, output. it's marketing. Yeah. It, it really is. Making it more accessible. Yeah. yeah. Um, OK, so speaking of accessibility, I, we talked about Lori, again, um, words. So just the words that you've sometimes found yourself using yeah. to, um, <laughs> That's right. uh, yeah. I think you know where I'm going. Yeah, we, we talked about um, just navigating technology as a woman early on. And uh, I would find myself quite often at uh, technology conferences and exhibit floors where there wasn't a lot of women. And the plus was that there was, for once and for all, no line at the ladies' room, which was awesome. Bravo. Um, <laughs> but I would go around with a male counterpart to the different um, exhibitor booths, and the, the guy in the booth would not look at me. They just wouldn't engage with me. So I found that if I said like a technology word, that it would level the playing field. So I would just go, USB, USB. You know, and, uh, <laughs> and then everything would be OK. And so I just spent all day going, USB. And I would just find ways to say it. Oh, did your USB fall on the floor? You know. Um, but, and, and I just found that you know, if you use the language, then, then the walls come down. Right. right, and then now I don't have to do that anymore, but I've gotten like obsessed about it. So now I still say USB, and people are like, "What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Why did you just say USB? You are you have having a grand mall?" Yeah, yeah. Got, like, yeah. People think I'm having a heart AI. attack or something. Yeah. Robot. Yeah. I, wanna, oh, go oh, ahead. I wanted to add yeah. something to that. Uh, that's really funny, and it actually has a very important point. Um, in our Women in Technology Tech Talks every month, one of the things I keep in my mind is that. Um, 
to introduce a new technology to all the women attending. And even if we don't go very deep into the technology, which I'm aware of, I get it in the survey results all the time, like go deep. But what I'm trying to do is that introduce as many new technologies as possible and ask the presenters to use all the keywords because then those keywords stick in your mind and when there's a conversation, say, within your group about a new technology, you can understand what they are saying and don't feel like uh, I, I have no clue and be more familiar. So there's something to be said about the words, paying attention to the type of words and what they mean and they can be very, very effective. So defining and getting really clear with people, yeah. Yeah. With your audience, that makes sense. Um, so Circle, uh, we actually had a partnership for the Technology Awards, the Lumiere Technology Awards in, yes. in January, Cisco uh, and AIS did. Um, and it was a wonderful show. It and thank you wonderful. for that. We're doing it again August 22nd. Awesome. I don't know if you knew. <laughs> no. You're coming to LA. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, there was a little something that we noticed um, when so we, we gave awards to 13 women, uh, outstanding women in the field of technology entertainment and entertainment technology, I mean. And as they got up, they sort of um, would generally say uh, things at the top that would sound something like, I don't, I don't think this is meant for me. I think you guys made a mistake. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and things like that. And Serpel noticed that there are similarities in the way that they, um, just the way that, that those sort of insecurities or, or thoughts are expressed that are similar to in Silicon Valley that they might be in LA or in Hollywood. So Yeah, so that was very interesting to me. First of all, thanks for inviting me to yeah, Hollywood. I had a great time in January uh, in West Hollywood. Is yeah, <laughs> oh, is that? <laughs> and um, so I was very impressed with all the women who received the award. Um, they were really kick-ass, awesome, smart woman. And, um, but I thought that uh, industry would be different than ours. I'm very familiar with the engineering, networking, Silicon Valley culture. It really struck me how uh, much similarities there were. They were commenting of the number of women not being so many. Uh, one of the, I think, uh, Award winners said, oh, all of us are here who work in this industry. I said, yeah, we, we are a pretty small community. And they did talk about uh, some of their struggles. And I was, very, um, I was very impressed with the similarities between seemingly very different uh, groups. And I thought that the two groups can really exchange these experiences and learn from each other and be stronger all together. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so. Lori, we're talking about story, and a lot of your um, work has to do with connecting people through story and commonalities. Um, what are some of the commonalities that you're finding now as it comes to that? Well, I, I think um, any time that you talk about um, te tech, I think, the more you connect it back to that person's own personal experience, the better that you do. Um, and so often when I'm giving tours, I relate back to family stories, like I just use my daughter with Alexa. So it doesn't matter where anyone comes from, if they're coming from Silicon Valley or if they're coming from Hollywood, but we all recognize a use case, say. Let's just call it a use case to, to use that, that expression. And so if you create a use case that everyone can connect to, then they immediately can understand. And I think that's true for Silicon Valley and Hollywood. Ours may involve like, you know, I said this yesterday, like, you know, a drug heist or something. I don't know, going to a dispensary or whatever. And yours may be, you know, um, I don't know, what do you guys do for fun? <laughs> meetups? Yeah, meetups. Yours may be a meetup. But the, yeah. but the, the idea is just okay. connecting over, you know, a, a use case, a, a familiar yeah. story that We're we can all connect. Humanizing it a little humanizing bit Humanizing it all, right. right. And the more that I tell stories like that, the more people can glom onto even complex yeah. ideas. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Jerry, you, came, you were in sales and went into engineering. Do I have way. that right? Other way. <laughs> Other way. Um, and we talked about um, communication therein. And so, and there's conscious kind of an unconscious things that go on in, in meetings and just in dealing with people. Um, and talk about that just a little bit in, as far as your experience in both worlds. Yeah, sure. So uh, right out of college, I became an engineer. It was my dream really to be an engineer and got lucky to get a role at Sun Microsystems. So I did that for 
a number of years, and being a woman that young in a male-dominated field never really occurred to me that there could be a bias, or perhaps that there was at the time. Um, I think as an engineer, you prove yourself every day in terms of your technical ability. So perhaps maybe I just found it easier. Um, I wasn't a circle, by the way. I was a lower level engineer. <laughs> um, but then, however, I moved into the world of sales uh, about eight years ago. And that was probably my first introduction to some bias within um, the industry and just corporate America in general, I found at that point. Um, it just is a little bit tougher to be able to prove yourself in what is still a, you know, in IT is a male-dominated industry, and we've got some fabulous women that, you know, are just even in this room that I have the pleasure of working with. But sometimes I think that there's just a bit of a bias um, that comes from still being a woman in technology. Um, the unbiased part is, or the unconscious part is what I've also realized, too. I think for some, it is unconscious. It doesn't occur to others, uh, whether it be both male and female. I've seen it from both sides. Uh, where there tends to be a little bit bias from a young, you know, female wanting to kind of make it in a world of management and within sales and within IT. So um, it's something that I see today, and I think that we are, especially at Cisco, we are making strides to be better about diversity and um, diverse opinions, and whether it be uh, ethnicity or male to female. Um, I love this company that we are making strides in that direction, all the good strides uh, in that direction. Like so. this program. It, yeah, for a perfect really, example, exactly. Yeah. And I think the Absolutely. conversations that are happening around this right now are phenomenal. We're seeing them all over the world. We're seeing them in small companies, huge companies. There's a lot of accountability from the top down. I mean, we've got a CMO right here in, in Silicon Valley who has five daughters at a major company, HP. Um, he is on every panel, on every day as any chance he has, and he's affecting change within their company and speaking to his colleagues. And, you know, there's, there's so much dialogue in this space right now. There's never been a time, a better time, for young women, older women to, to step forward and say, I'm here and I am absolutely worthy of this. So it's an incredible time in our history business-wise, personally, with humanity. We're not there yet, but the conversations are powerful and they are happening everywhere. And it's, it's something to step into. I was fortunate when I started my business 30 years ago, the conversation wasn't happening. So there was never a question for me as to can I, can't I, should I, shouldn't I? I just did. I kind of wanted to do it, I wanted to run a business, and I just went out there and did it. And the conversations weren't stopping me or making me question what I was doing because there were no conversations, which was great. But I think the interim has been sort of very challenging because it's been sort of bubbling, but the conversations weren't happening. Now they're happening. So it's bringing all these communities together and making this happen together is really having, it's affecting change. I think that bias point is really powerful too because I don't even think half the time people realize it. And I think I told you guys the story about how my eight-year-old came home um, one day and she said that the boys said that the pink Legos don't count as Legos. You know, and she's eight, you know, and it's like, and I was like, then I had a whole like, have some ice cream and let me tell you how it is, you know, and then she wanted to do something else right away. But anyway, <laughs> but, but my point is that that bias gets doled out early on and we just have to, you know, do our best to unwind it, yeah. you know. Serpil, what's been your experience with, um, with any kind of bias that way, and what are some tools that you've used to overcome it and see change? Um, first of all, I think the bias, unconscious bias issue is um, relevant to everyone, man or woman. Um, I notice some unconscious bias against myself that I hold. <laughs> um, and I want to give an example. When I attended the Women in Technology Forum in 2012, which really is the thing that got started the Women in Technology series later on, um, I was sitting in the audience, and there were all these mostly young women engineers who come up the stage, and they said, um, I'm an inventor, I'm an engineer, I do this, I'm a change agent. I was sitting there thinking, we can't do that? Is that OK? You know, I, I did not realize that. I never considered myself someone who can get in front of the people. Mm. Um, and that's a personal bias, in my opinion, that I wasn't, I wasn't aware that I had that 
uh, that. Now, in terms of our male colleagues, I do I see a lot of unconscious bias, and it's sometimes hard to communicate that because because it's unconscious. The other person can be a very nice person and means very well, but you can totally see that you are treated a little differently than your other male colleagues. And um, you know, approaching these uh, require a lot of, uh, I think, courage to be able to bring it up and not let go, but do it in a way that you, know, you open the dialogue instead of blaming the other person. Um, and there is some also blatant bias, uh, those we have to deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis. <laughs> Luckily, they are not as common as one might think. Yeah. And Lori, same question to you. What are some of those tools um, besides USB, USB? <laughs> <laughs> uh, to deal with the bias? Um, you know, sometimes I will uh, I'll call someone out. But more than anything else, what I have found that I have done is I've created other situations where the bias can't get in the way. So like, for instance, um, curating industry events. Um, I'll go the extra mile myself to make sure that there are women on the panel. Um, even though, believe it or not, and I think you guys all know this, women are more difficult to get to do industry panels because they are afraid for the very things that you just said. They think they're not good enough. They want to be overprepared. They're less likely to say yes um, right away. Men, for some reason, say yes right away. And so a lot of people that curate events end up just going with the men because it's easier, because women are more challenging to work with. But women on panels are more prepared, you know, are more layered in some of what they talk about. I'm generalizing, but so what, but what I have found that I do is I'll create events where I can get more women up there to, to break down a bias, because I'm willing to do the extra work. You know. I wanted to add something in terms of tools. I don't think I talked about that part very much. I think um, if you are in an environment, it's completely biased. I don't know if there's a whole lot you can do. I mean, you can speak up. You can present yourself in a way that is more assertive, uh, etc. What I found is that if you do have a manager, an advisor, someone who really supports you and uh, really uh, understands the issues, it gets a little bit easier. So that's why I always say when they ask me career advice, um, I pick my managers more than my job or my company. I think it's very important who you're working for. If you have the option to uh, choose, um, you know, I always keep my eye open for the kind of people that I admire, I would want to work for, who would create the right environment for me to in general, uh, stand up against others. So having someone that you can go to um, exchange ideas about how to deal with those things. I also found that, believe it or not, um, how you dress, how you present yourself um, in meetings sometimes helps. I used to go to them as an engineer, you know, I have my ripped jeans and my t-shirt and I went with that for 20 years. <laughs> uh, but the big change is happening uh, in the last probably five, six years is that um, because I do know that there is some sort of a appearance effect in people uh, in the way that they take you seriously. And I try to keep that in mind. It's not that I'm superficial or I'm any different than I, I am when I dress differently, but I do try to make an effort. Well, I think I would, I'd love to add to that. I think it's, it's the combination of that which was something I was going to raise because I do think that when I was 24 years old and I started a company, I was a little girl starting a company and I wore my suit and I had my pearls on and my perfect little earrings and I'd show up every day suited up for business no matter what. So no matter who I was walking into a room with, whether it was my staff, whether it was colleagues, whether it was presenting to a new client, whether it was meetings with clients, I never went anywhere without my suit on, ever. And, and heels. I mean, when people finally started seeing me, I worked on the World Cup in 94, so we went from business meetings, planning, strategy, all the work that we were doing all over the country, to showing up at the events and I was in my tennis shoes and they'd all go, you're so short. I said, I've always been short. But they never knew it because I never showed up without my heels because yeah. I'm short. That being said, coupled with, and Cheryl said this earlier, knowledge. 
Knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. Knowledge puts you at the table, in the room, holding your own, and having the dialogue. And if you think that you're entitled just because you're a woman, in this new conversation that's going on, to show up and be entitled to have that job, have that respect, because you're going to play that card, that's not the way to do it. It's being bright. It's being informed. It's being communicative. It's really showing up with those tools, which are going to enable you to own that. And I think the combination of those two are really important things to really show up with. Yep. We only have, uh, oh, we only have a long time. OK, <laughs> we're good. <laughs> I thought it was going the other way. Um, I would love to talk about, <laughs> can we go right, down the line? That. I'm just going to chill. Um, a while. <laughs> some professional goals over the next year. Um, Jerry. Yeah, no, um, I, I can start with that. Uh, so. Uh, very important to me. So I have, um, like I said, moved into a new team within media within this this uh, last year, and I have okay. some young professionals that work as part of my team. And for me, something important that I really want to focus on is going to be a sponsorship and mentorship for some of the folks that are within Cisco from our younger generation. And I don't mean younger just by age, but younger into the field. I've got some fabulous folks that are new in career, early in career, I should say, at the age of 30. But um, it's important. I mean, I think uh, I think that there's a bit of a un, you know, unconscious bias towards millennials for some. Mm -hmm. I think uh, some of that is deserved. Some of it's not deserved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that um, some of the young folks coming into IT. I think that there's a lot of knowledge that they can gain by some of us who have been in the industry longer. Um, I'm only 25, by the way, uh, so uh, I'm going to help us where I can. But um, I think there's a, a, for me, it's important to be able to sponsor and mentor a lot of these folks to, to allow them the knowledge I have gained you know, over the last 18 years of my career and also see their side coming out of college some or even some in the high school coming out and gain some of their knowledge or just views of the world that perhaps I don't see. And so I think that that's important. It's really a two-way street, but it's something I really want to focus on um, that I think would be beneficial to them as individuals, which I love seeing. Um, but also to Cisco as a company and to those of us in technology that really want to help push you know, the envelope in terms of where we go with technology. So um, that's really going to be my focus. I've started, and it's going to be my focus over the next year. That works. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything that you're going to do in particular just um, that are some personal goals that you'd like to push yourself towards to make sure that that, that, that happens? Um, to either dial up or... Yeah, I have. Uh, so today I've got uh, three mentors that I use specifically, two within Cisco, one without, um, one outside of Cisco. And I've got two folks that I mentor today, and I actually want to up that number. Um, I'd love to have four that I really focus on. Uh, today, the, the way that Cisco is set up, uh, the two that I mentor today are within my industry or within my vertical, so to speak, from Cisco. I'd like to find some that are outside of that to also be able to gain um, technical knowledge and, and pass through to that as well and gain their experiences. Great. Serpal, same question. <laughs> um, I think professionally, uh, I really like being involved in newer technologies and kind of being at the cutting edge and then pushing that towards the deployment. I, you know, I, I really like seeing the stuff I work on being used and uh, helpful. So. Um, this year, I'm hoping that my involvement with that will be a little bit more higher level. You know, as an engineer all these years, I have been the person who likes to do things herself. You know, full control, I do it myself. But in the past several years, I have had teams working with me. And I have really enjoyed uh, creating this team atmosphere where People can do kind of what they want, but at the same time, we're all working towards a goal. And uh, you know, I take the time to understand where we're heading as an industry, what are the right things we should be working on. So I, I think I would like to do more of that. And I want to give an example. This is really excellent. Um, I had an international intern who was with us for a whole year from China. And we were working on this you know, in, in internet infrastructure project. And he was fidgeting all the time. And he wasn't doing everything that I asked him. He was kind of breaking things. And I 
had a conversation with him and I said, what's going on? And he said, oh, I don't know, I'm kind of bored. And I was like, what do you want to do? He said, I want to do a mobile app or something, which really had nothing to do with our project. But then it occurred to me that he could create a mobile app version of the project that we were doing, which had a user portal. So I gave him that task and for the rest of his internship, he was great, he created that. And that was probably the first in the area that we work on. Uh, when I am able to help create those kind of uh, changes and in inventions, instead of doing it myself, but doing it through a team, that's been really enjoyable to me. There's a lot of work to be done on the uh, infrastructure side um, uh, to make the network even more intelligent, more flexible. Uh, there's still ways to go, so I'll be working on that. On the uh, woman in technology side, um, the more women I can mentor, the more women I can push forward, the more women I can encourage to take more leadership roles is uh, the, the better for me. Um, uh, one of the things I've noticed is that women come to me for career advice, and it's kind of always around what they're already doing and maybe expanding a little bit. And I'm really trying to encourage them to take more leadership type of roles. And uh, you know, we complain about leaders, but if we don't take a step towards doing that, then we will continue to complain. So I'm hoping to help as many people as I can. Um, Kathy and Lori, there's so much about VR, AR, and holograms, and you guys are both in those worlds, uh, that comes down to human er interaction or the lack thereof and the pain points that are involved in that often come about having to do with sort of the struggle of not being, you know, being out of touch or being isolated. Um, and then do these stories work? Do I get to have an emotional experience here? You know, so do you think that uh, expressive communication in developing immersive technologies is even more key in immersive technologies than in other you know, areas of tech? And if so, are women even more awesome at it? <laughs> <laughs> you want to start? I've got the pleasure of working with the hologram industry and also the VR industry because of two of our clients. So it, it's really interesting. I'm getting a lot of perspective in sort of what we do in the traditional world and clients that we work with and all these experiences and touch points and then the digital world and seeing the pendulum swinging back and forth and back and forth. And right now, what's fascinating about the hologram space is that experiencing hologram is a shared experience. You go to a concert, an event, and these are things that one of our clients is producing these massive iconic global hologram concerts with very iconic stars. You've got 4,000 fans in a performing arts center watching Roy Orbison on a stage as a hologram with the Live Symphony Orchestra. And they're all like going, oh my god, look at that. They're all in it together, like they're at a real concert. Very different from a VR experience. And what's wonderful is our client Birdly, if any of you were at the Tech Museum here in San Jose, you would have seen the Birdly exhibit which is sort of a beyond the goggles experience of being having the VR goggles on, going through an immersive experience, but you're fully controlling your whole experience. So that is definitely a more individualized experience. I think that women naturally are connectors. We are about the emotion, we're about the connection points, we're about communication. We're just wired that way. And I think that as we start to look through the lens of the VR world and experience and growth or the hologram world, we're always going to look at how to bring it back to that for people. And I think that's why for me, working with clients in the hologram space is really wonderful because I love the fact that it can be all about, hey guys, let's all go to this concert. Let's have an experience together. And that is a very enjoyable thing for us to do together, whereas VR is that singular experience. So I think, you know, trying to bring it full circle, the point of view I come from as a woman is to always make sure that we're helping to deliver a better experience for people and how we bring brands on to do that as well. And even with clients and brands that we're dealing with that want to show up, whether it's at a mall, whether it's to do an interesting marketing partnership, we're always going to go back to how are you going to use technology to connect with people in a deeper, more meaningful way. And these tools are enabling us to do it. So, Thanks, yeah. Lori. 
Yeah, I was, I, my experience with all these immersive technologies, I have a lot of colleagues who are now becoming VR, AR producers, mm -hmm. female colleagues um, who maybe were actually in visual effects. And what I think is fascinating, and I think it is a sort of female thing, is the ability to uh, manage art and tech together and manage art resources, meaning filmmakers and theater directors who are playing a big role in VR right now and um, other artists, and then also be able to talk to engineers and programmers and coders and all those guys and be able to speak both their languages. And so I think that's a you know generally a uniquely female thing to be able to multitask and merge those worlds yeah. together. And immersive tech, more than anything I've seen in a long time, requires this ability to understand the art and the tech together. And so that's exciting to me because there's a big movement right now with women in VR um, and women in AR and just across the board. As a female, I don't like putting goggles on my face because I spend a lot of time getting to look like this. I, I bet you didn't know that. <laughs> but I just don't like that feeling of things on my face. So I'm looking forward to when the distribution is a little friendlier of all these technologies, and we're going to get there pretty quickly, I think. Um, but I think that's another use case scenario, is I have a lot of female friends. If you're out on a date and you look at the use case of VR, they don't want to put a headset on when they're on a date. Maybe that's later on right. when you know the guy's seen them in every version of themselves. But, but th <laughs> no, just think about it, or the gal, or whatever the, the situation is. But So I think we have to think about that, too, that as a gender, we tend you know, to be a little bit more sensitive to that. So, so there's a couple of exciting things from the gender perspective on immersive technologies. And I'd love to just go back to the question you asked before, because I think there's also something really important in this conversation about us as women, and when you talk about our goals, our business goals for the future. So as a woman-owned company, almost 30 years in business, 99.9% .9 of the people that have worked for me have been women. And that was not by design. Um, I remember having a male intern once. That's pretty sad that I remember that. Um, but one of my goals is actually, and I have five interns right now working for us, which I love because of the mentoring aspect. And I spend a lot of time mentoring a lot of young people to really sort of you know, get exposure to the world of business we're in and you know, really how to grow a company and the things we do with our clients, which is exciting. But my goal is actually to have more men come into the company. And I, I have many reasons for that. One is that I think that the men that spend time within women's conversations and women's environments are going to go into the world and be the better men that they can be. And I think it's really critical that while we're all banding together as women and very focused on what's important for us, that we have to make way for where men fit in this conversation and how we can help them be better versions of themselves by understanding what's possible, how we function, who we are, what our capabilities are. That guy may go on one day to be an executive, a senior executive at a company, and he will draw on those experiences of having worked around a lot of women and hopefully grown from that. So I think it's really important that we're, we're not sort of, you know, this is the girls club, and then we're doing what the boys have done. Right. And we don't want to be doing that. So I think it's a really important part of this conversation. Yeah, right. Civil rights can't just exist in a vacuum where it's just only women yeah. doing it, right? All humans. Yeah. yeah. Us women okay. are a lot Robots, of too. And robots, <laughs> and robo robots. Uh, robots. Robots, robots yeah. on robots. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a response to that, anybody, before no, I jump into the I like the what you were saying about bringing more men into the conversation. That's the only thing, is I don't think that we should be over-rotating um, where I've seen that, where it's like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm recruiting a team. Let me go and find women that fit. I'm all for finding the best talent yeah. regardless. And I think that we need to be clear to not over-rotate and say, let's just hire women. Yeah. That's not the way to go. It's still about finding the best talent. Um, my point is, just don't overlook because they're women or we're young or anything. Are. Yeah, exactly. It just shouldn't even be even considered. I'm prejudiced against redheads, though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. So maybe a little tangentially, but it, it fits. Uh, something like only about 20% of employees in tech are women. I read this stat somewhere. Does anybody want to just take a stab at, at why that might be? Or 
how we got there and how it might change. I mean, I mean, you guys have a better sense of it up here. I know, I know I talk about this a lot with other female strategists in technology, and we just don't often, we're not in the consideration set sometimes when an opportunity comes up. And if I'm in the room, and I told you guys this before, like if I'm in the room, they'll go, oh, I should have called you for that. And I'm always like, well, why didn't you? And for some reason, we're not always in the consideration set. And so what I've heard many, many times is just you know, opportunities. Sometimes women in tech just don't get served up as many opportunities. And I think that's the piece we have to change. We may not be the right resource, but let's get served up the opportunity so that we can figure that part out. I think a little bit more point to your question, though, is why are there not more women in tech? And I'll tell you that, um, you know, I'll say that I have a ton of friends that are very successful women. None of them are interested for two seconds about what I do. Um, it's just a lot of times they're just not, you know. We are. Yeah, I appreciate are. you guys we are. are. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I thought about that. I, I work with a lot of other colleagues within the IT industry um, with other major corporations. And, you know, IT, you know, doing what Circle does, just sometimes it's just not sexy to other women. And that's okay. I think that if you were to look at, you know, put out an engineering job, you'd be surprised how many resumes you see for male versus female. And that is okay. It's just you know, it just could not be something that um, I think when, when women go to college, it's just it, we're still going to kind of be the minority. And I think that that's fine. That's, you know, perfectly right. okay the play patterns. to I mean, do it. Look at the play patterns. And I don't know if anybody saw the announcement, but apparently there is now a woman engineer, Barbie, that just got announced. Yeah, she did, yeah. She's, <laughs> like, I just saw this this morning or yesterday, yeah. and I just thought I just ordered it's it. about the early <laughs> play patterns. Yeah. And I have a girlfriend who is a huge advisor to Google and all of these internet tech companies mm -hmm. in Hollywood, somebody you should meet. Um, and it's just fascinating when you look at the play patterns you know, a lot of them are traditional, but if companies like Mattel and others start to really integrate this into their play patterns, that doll that they're playing with may be the one similar to what you were doing when you yeah, were little. You know, sure. you, you want to be able to do it, but if people aren't creating the toys and the conversations not happening at home and mom is not of that world or dad isn't, then they're just repeating the play patterns. So right. we have to introduce new ones for me. That, that, that is Hollywood's fault, right, for not yeah. putting women. So sorry, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> no, but That's really, why Eileen really is. is so great, because yeah. she's helping change those. Right. You, need, you need women, you need the, the wife having an engineering job and the girlfriend right. or whatever. And, and you, need to, you need kids need to grow up seeing other roles so that they're comfortable. Exactly. Just like you could not find that Ray doll anywhere when the Star Wars came out, because yeah. they underproduced yeah, them. Exactly. And boys wanted that Ray doll. Or why is always the girl toy of any show always made less? You know, yeah. like you, you can never get the female version of things. And it's just a fact that, that you know, the toy company it's underproduced the female character. And why was the yes. pink Power Ranger pink? Right. She could have been yellow, yeah, not she pink, because that yeah. stereotypes a right. girl. Yeah, yeah. Have you guys heard Goldie Blocks? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's Goldie the Blocks. engineering uh, yeah. toys for girls. Yeah. yeah. And last year's Grace Hopper uh, conference, there was an excellent right, speech fine. by the founder of uh, uh, Goldie Blocks. Yeah. I yeah. highly recommend you I'm listen YouTuber, how you she, seen it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, how she I came yeah, about the loves, founding. Yeah, that. my kid loves that stuff. Yeah, loves it. Yeah, so I want to say a few words about why we, where do I start? Um, okay, you guys started at the pipeline, that's good. Um, <laughs> there are so many reasons. Um, but I like to start with uh, reiterating something that my boss talked about in, actually, there's a book called Internet of Things, and there's an afterword, and David Ward, who is in the audience, hello, Dave. Uh, <laughs> talked about uh, managing uh, senior tech talent and managing, uh, you know, women, uh, technical women who are trying to move up in their careers and what do you need to do. And one of the things he said there that I completely agree uh, is that, uh, you know, just like our male 
counterparts, we want to work on cool stuff. We want to work on challenging projects. We want to be given the opportunity to really have a good time. I mean, that's why we became engineers. We didn't become engineers to day in and day out, write the same code, test the same device, uh, write excellent reports so that the company can make a lot. I mean, that's part of the job. We all knew that. But we want to be excited about what we are doing. And in my opinion, women are not given as many opportunities as men. Now, we can talk another hour why that is, and I'm not going to say it's all men's problem or corporations. I think it's a collective problem that needs solving, and I personally feel that there is a big middle management issue, the training, the help the middle management needs to be able to um, you know, give these projects more freely to experiment, take a risk, maybe someone who's just coming up the ranks. I mean, I can't tell you the number of things that they've pushed me to do. It's like being in the fire all the time. But with that, I've grown and I feel like I'm having a good time. I'm making... So I think having the opportunity, having the excitement is one of the reasons why um, a lot of the technical women who are already in the industry to have like second thoughts, should I go to program management? Maybe it's more interesting. Maybe that way I can get the big picture and be more impactful. Um, so that needs to be fixed in my opinion. We need more uh, of that. Now, in terms of children, I can't quite get my head around it. So when I was little, I was very interested in things, but there were no toys associated with that. And I grew up in back in Turkey, rural area, you know, it was considered to be mostly boys. I know this is not most of your experience. This is my experience. Uh, but now I'm looking at my daughter. I have a 15-year-old daughter who is very talented in math. Um, she does not want to have anything to do with engineering. For the life of me, I don't know why. Um, she thinks she's really bad at it. In fact, she's very good. She's also playing music, so I know math and music go together. She's very intelligent, and she can do great things. But from her point of view, technology, engineering, all of these things are kind of like hard and boring, and she just doesn't want to deal with that. So she wants to be a director film director and wants to boss people around. That's what she used to say, at least. So um, I, so th those things are in my mind. What is the impression she's getting, what it means right. to be a technologist? Plus, she sees me working very hard. I have long hours sometimes, and I try so the directors, to. directors, they keep really long hours. Yeah. So she doesn't have <laughs> a good sure example. She right. <laughs> but she sees me working all the time, and she's thinking, I don't know if send I want to do her to that. Me for a summer. Oh. I, I think I should. <laughs> I think I should. And I wonder how many of my colleagues who are sitting here, you know, who are mothers, you know, running around trying to take care of the family, take care of the kids. They are on the conference calls as they drive. By the way, this is not just women. This is also say, men. We're all doing that, yeah. exactly. But I think there's something interesting in what you said about the perception she has yes. of technology and engineering being boring and dry. And maybe there's something in that that we have to look at as an industry and say, yes. how do we shift that perception? You know, jigsaw puzzles are fun. You know, yes. what are what are the components? I mean, it's like a branding exercise for the industry. I'm, yeah. I'm onto something. <laughs> you know, how do we really take the notion of technology, engineering, this whole space? Yeah, she can't and, live without and she, Instagram. Okay, well, how does she think? What does she think? You know, it's like, what's behind Instagram? Right. That's the challenge. Yeah. Right. How would you like to create the next Instagram? Right. That would make you someone that lives in this space. Now, that would be a cool conversation for her, but there is something about the broader subject that I think a lot of people, that's the issue. Yeah. The yeah. perception it's is the it's and not what they aspire to because they school. don't get it. Right. Yeah. Just to throw something else out there, too. I mean, my mother was a um, you know, single mom raising four girls, and I've got three sisters that, again, could care less about technology. I have no idea where I got it from. <laughs> I, I mean, really have none. I mean, I was in elementary school, and I saw these robots and thought, I'm playing with those. Yeah, and robots. then I saw you know, some Legos, <laughs> if you guys were familiar with Lego logos right. back in the day, controlled by computers. And I just took an interest. I just thought, that's cool. And I just loved taking things apart and putting them back together and programming it with my computer and sending my first email by picking up the, you know, the receiver and setting it down and waiting and then typing my one line. And, uh, but I don't have any idea where I got that love from. I just did. So 
your daughter you may think, think it's boring. There was a I, teacher I, or somebody. That yeah, I have no idea. Well, and it's that idea of taking a step back, right? So it's yeah. like you see the final result. You see the cool thing, yeah. the yeah. Instagram, the robot, right. the whatever it is. Yeah. And then you zero in and get really, really close to all the dots on the, on right. the Monet. And it, you get into the nitty gritty. And the then it's a little solving. bit more difficult yeah. to find it as exciting as maybe yeah. what it looks like when you step back. Yeah. Yeah. Nerds are just born. Some yeah. are just born. See this, the bumper sticker that everybody needs to see. Yeah. But there are, you, to your point, like the there's a toy out by it's called uh, Make uh, Make Wonder Wonder. You know Dot and Dash. Are you familiar with those? Oh, those? I have seen the Dot and Dash. Yeah, Dot and robots. Dash are these two little robots, and um, and the kids program them just by drop and drag. Yeah. And actually build code. To and build they do. the code. That's and so cool. my daughter's been playing that with the last two years, and she loves it. So she's growing up with this idea that robots are cool, and she's building a rowboat. Oh. Just, I just wanted to bring it back. <laughs> she brought it back. It's a callback. <laughs> it's a callback. I like the tea. <laughs> we have um, three, about four minutes left. Um, I think it's time to take some questions. Yeah. Oh, Does anybody have, uh, is there a floating mic, first of all? You have one there. OK, great. Is there a question? Any one. raise of hand? Anybody? There's one here in green. Good looking bunch. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. We're talking about um, women in engineering and all that. So I think I also grew up in Bombay, and I didn't have any of these toys and all that. So I think it was inherently interesting in technology. But technology is boring. I mean, not for people like me who's just love. I mean, I, <laughs> if I have to chill out, I use programming. Like, you know, I mean, Python is my go-to place to just chill out and relax. But there was a data written in one of the magazines who say why women are not in technology. It was very interesting that the women from the developed countries where there's poverty, not poverty in the sense where there are less opportunities for women, they go into technologies. Like so India, South India, like a lot of women will go because that's their ticket to personal freedom. But women's inherent skill is in speech and as you know communicator and so they tend to stay away. So people in you know, Europe and mm -hmm. America where women have broader uh, spectrum of opportunities, they, as you said, like your daughter will choose to go into you know, other fields than technology because they can still make a good career in the field that is natural. So I think we do not, my question is, I mean, I've, I love these talks because you know, they resonate with me. But coming with the next generation of uh, women, I think we're not doing them a justice by putting our interest and trying to map them, saying we need them toys and all that. We really look at what is it that makes a, makes a woman, like you know, majority of women, not choosing technology. I'd like to get more data on it. I mean, we are the ones who mine the data, so we should be yeah. <laughs> looking into that. Could that you was work my on question. That for us? Yeah, <laughs> I, I actually, I disagree with some parts of what you're saying. Um, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> um, technology could be very sexy and interesting. Maybe part of the problem is we don't have good role models. You guys need yeah. to make movies about yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. us over yeah. here yeah. Yeah. and present us a little bit differently. I also uh, think that uh, I don't think we should generalize women as only good communicators and social people. I, I think there is a tremendous amount of um, unmet, uh, the un, not discovered potential out there for technical woman, technical thinking. Um, I, I think I, I agree with you that we shouldn't be forcing our uh, you know, wishes to our children. But at the same time, we may be setting them up for um, excluding technology from a very early age, so it never even comes up. So either way, it's a bad idea. What I am thinking is that this is happening very early in their life. I bet my daughter had some sort of a bad math or science experience where she decided that this is too hard. Right. Um, so I think we should be careful how we label all women. I, I think we should let individuals be individuals and be able to present them with lots of options and um, let them see the fun parts of it. I had a fantastic career. I don't think it's been boring at all. Well, uh, it might yeah. look boring right. to some, but, <laughs> but think, it's been you know, fascinating. Serpil, I think you said something interesting. We also have to look at how we define technology and engineering and 
The role of a chief marketing officer at a company now requires that they understand technology, that they understand what it is, how to use it, how to apply data. There are this criteria now that fits into the framework of so many things that we do in business that we cannot do without the understanding of technology and engineering. So it's not that all of these young women should want to grow up to be engineers per se, but they need to be the people working directly with people in the technology and engineering space, speaking the same language, understanding actually what to do with it, how to utilize it, and how to further anything they're doing in business. So I think there's a lot of sides, a lot of points of entry into this conversation as well. It's not linear, and maybe that's the conversation that actually needs to start changing. And that's how kind we of how we started it. this day, was saying it's a dialogue about dialogue. Right. How do we talk to each other, right? Exactly. When we come from different worlds and right. different mindsets. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, another question. Um, I actually didn't have a question. I wanted to join Circle in disagreeing with you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, when you said that women uh, from developing countries have no choice but to uh, embark on technology, I think that's uh, that's partly true because uh, you know sometimes more uh, uh, families who are focused on making means. Uh, um, um, kind of uh, uh, putting food on the table and such and are more focused tend to do that. But I think also there is this trend of outsourcing which has led to more of the developing and BRIC countries having the uh, more of these jobs outsourced to them and then whereby they picked up all of the technical skills. That was the only point I wanted to make. But I, I think to add to the larger uh, kind of discussion, um, I think w when we are young, we impinge on some of the things more. Uh, and, and that's uh, got every bit to do with the toys that we play with, you know, the little girls, that the pink Legos that they're handed over while they are Legos, they are pink. So all of those uh, things also kind of tend to create that um, uh, mental connections. So that also has to play a part there. I think I want to reemphasize what Kathy was saying. Maybe the solution or, or the direction we need to take is that technology is not a linear thing. Entertainment is not a linear thing. Nothing is linear anymore. There's sort of a convergence of various things together. I mean, I was thinking maybe my next project should be a hologram <laughs> in the lab doing something. I don't know. You know, maybe using the immersive technologies that are really becoming much more available to people, uh, we can uh, make technology a whole lot more understandable, relatable to our children. I mean, really, the education is also where it's at. The way uh, these things are thought is very dry and for some children, in incredibly boring. I mean, we really should start thinking about changing that. Right. And that could apply to social sciences too. I told my daughter last year, I have tickets to see Hamilton. I thought she was going to you know, leap up and down with joy. And she said, I don't want to see it. I was like, what? Why? <laughs> he, she said, history is super boring. I was confused oh. about the whole thing. I said, you're coming. You don't have to like it. You're going to sit in the back and just sit there. She loved it, and she said, well, if they taught it like this, then I would have liked it, right, you right, know? Right, right. It's a history example, yeah. but it could be applied it's to math example. and science. Exactly. Right. Okay. So I you're almost saying, like, use tech to teach about tech. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I wanted to just mention one thing. There's also Gina Davis's, um, yes. you know, Gender Institute, yep. which has a ton of reports and research on yes, I follow right yeah. that women who aren't who aren't there aren't enough women roles in media and that impacts what our little girls want to grow up to be yeah. so that is a reality it just is a reality and the more we arm ourselves with that data um, the more we'll be able to change that story yeah to arming yourself with story. the knowledge because that's power right yeah. Yeah. yeah I think we have time for one we have time for zero more but we'll take one more Hi. Uh, can you hear There's me? Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> this is a different question. I love technology, so, uh, but oftentimes I hear that uh, we need to do networking and socializing. You know, that will uh, improve to move forward in career. Uh, I'm a software engineer in the development team, mostly involved in uh, coding, you know, hand, head down and uh, very strong, you know, <laughs> delivery yeah. and all that time, learning and uh, it's fully involved in this. So what is, what are your suggestions and 
to move forward right, you know, for most women like me with these kind of thoughts. I'm happy to address part of that. So when I was 24 in my little suits and pearl necklaces and out there trying to build a business, I used to go to a networking breakfast at 7 a.m. once a week. And I used to go to the Chamber of Commerce mixers once a month in the evenings. And I just constantly put myself out there, even though the work I had to do was behind the desk. But at the same time, it helped me listen to the conversations going on from other people that helped me grow as a business person, as a human being. And I think that if you're comfortable putting yourself in those kind of situations, and I think Liz talked about you know, go, going into a party and finding one person you know and kind of following them, you might have to do that, so take someone with you. But the more you do that, the more you'll also recognize where what you're interested in can connect with other parts, kind of what we were talking about, that the world of technology is not a one-way street. And you'd be surprised at how many other people that you walk into a room with in different vocations, different businesses, come from different places, are intrigued, interested, or likewise you may be. So I urge you to seek out things like this, to connect with your community, whatever that is, and not only like-minded people, but actually people in other industries because you just never know when the light bulb's gonna go on for you or where what you're doing today could really connect with people that you meet in other ways in the future. And you're young enough where this is gonna to continue to serve you if you continue to grow that network. I mean, if you knew how many people were in my database, I still call it a Rolodex. Mm -hmm. It's because I, I collect people, <laughs> if you will, and I love, People. I love stories. I love figuring out how everybody's connected. I mean, the moment Lori and I started talking, it was like, I have to connect you with this person because they'd be really good for you. And so, yeah, I enjoy that. Not everybody does, but I think the more your head is down, the more you need to walk into some of those rooms because it'll open up a world to and you. And it was like the quote that Liz had about um, going into the fear and not doing it without the fear, but in spite of the yeah, fear, right? Exactly. I thought that was great. And, and there's, another, yeah. there's another quote from yesterday. You weren't here, but there were two recruiters oh, yeah. uh, talking about you know, how to find your next job, et cetera. Um, the gentleman said that, well, I can't tell you if you should take that job or not, but I can tell you, take the meeting, take yes. the phone call, yes. take the coffee offer. As an engineer who was behind the, her laptop and in the lab for 15 years, I kind of created my own echo chamber. I had other women engineers like me, and we said, oh, we, you know, we are doing the real work, and I don't know what's going on there. We are the best. It creates a little bit of an echo that you are not aware of. But if you can keep an open mind to listen and learn and what's going on, I think that's where the real change happens. Uh, you really have to be connected to the rest of the world in some way. Uh, women in tech sessions, these meetings, what have you. I but like yeah. on that. If, if you're an employee here at Cisco, I assume, um, my quick advice is join Glassbreakers. I love it. I use it all the time uh, where I'm at. But um, I, Cisco has invested in Glassbreakers. And I mean, if you guys, if you haven't heard of it or done it, I was just doing it. it gives you an opportunity to, it's kind of like online dating. You give your profile, right? But it links you with people all over the company who do different roles. They're in different verticals than you are. They will be in sales. They'll be in engineering. They'll be in marketing. And it has allowed me to expand just my reach within Cisco. Forget about you know then the outside feelings and or something like that. But if you don't belong, join. I really think that that could be an easy next step for you. That's really just at the you know right in your laptop. I was also going to just add mm -hmm. last. Um, Check out an improv class. I know that sounds crazy, but improv is a great way to get other skills, and you'll meet other wacky people, and you can all hang out at dispensaries in Hollywood together. You're but she's <laughs> wacky? Did you see she's wacky? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean I improv or, or something that has nothing to do with anything. Yeah, we related. have Toastmasters. Takes yeah. you out of that, your that's head as and engaging yeah. with other people. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, that's doing as far things, as we go. Doing things that have nothing to do with your job here. That's you know, I always do things that have nothing to do with. Well, it nurtures yeah. your soul, and you can never go wrong when you're nurturing your soul. Nice. We're out of time, but Serpal, when is the next Women in Tech um, 
Um, I'll know? send the announcement. Okay. We don't have the exact okay. date, but we will have one in July. And thank you for all coming to that. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> thank you. Good job. Go out and be superheroes. What's that? Christine oh. is gonna... And Christine, come back up here. Yeah. Christina. Yeah. Christine. I think we can just let her wrap it up. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Um, thank you, Lisa, for moderating that uh, panel, as well as the panelists, um, Jerry, Serple, Lori, Kathy. Um, thank you for sharing your shared experiences with all of us. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, hope you leave inspired to really continue collaborating between the North and the South, Silicon Valley, and Hollywood. You know, I never knew there were so many intersections. So thank you for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.